Turning the Heart to God by St. Theophan the Recluse Chapter 2 The State of a Sinner The sinner who is to be renewed through repentance is often described in the Word of God as being submerged in a deep sleep. The distinctive feature of such persons is not necessarily their manifest depravity. It is rather the absence of an active, heartfelt, and selfless desire for pleasing God, together with a resolute aversion for everything that is sinful. Piety is not the primary object of their concern and labor. They are concerned about many other things, but are absolutely indifferent to the matter of their own salvation and are not aware of the danger they are in. They are neglectful of a good and righteous life and lead a life that is cold to faith although this life may sometimes be outwardly irreproachable. These are the general features characteristic of a sinner. The particular features of a man who has deprived himself of grace are presented as follows. Having turned away from God, a man becomes censored on himself and puts himself as the main object of his entire life and activity. This is certain because after God there is nothing greater for a man than himself. Having received the fullness of grace previously, and having now become empty without God, he is in a hurry and concerned with how and by what means he can fill this emptiness which is inside of him. This emptiness, which was formed in him as a result of falling away from God, kindles in him an incessant craving that nothing can satisfy. This craving is vague, but constant. A man becomes a bottomless abyss. He tries hard to fill this abyss, but he cannot. That is why for his whole life he is in sweat, toil, and great troubles. He busies himself with various things in hopes of finding satisfaction for this craving that consumes him. These things occupy his entire attention, all his time, and the whole of his activity. They are his highest good, to which he has devoted his whole heart. Hence, it is clear why a man who sets himself up as the main object of his life can never be within himself. He is always focused on things outside of himself, on the things which were created or devised as a result of his own vanity in order to fill his craving. He has fallen away from God, who is the fullness of everything. He is empty in himself. The only thing that remains is to spread himself among the endless variety of things and to live through them. So a sinner is thirsty, anxious, and troubled about many and various things which are apart from himself and apart from God. That is why the characteristic feature of a sinful life, when one is neglectful of his salvation, is an anxiety and trouble about many things. The nuances and distinctive features of these troubles about many things depend upon the kind of emptiness which is formed in the soul. The emptiness of the mind, which has forgotten about the one who is everything, gives birth to a concern for excessive knowledge, for much scrutiny, curiosity, and inquisitiveness. The emptiness of the will, which has deprived itself of the one who is everything, produces numerous desires striving to possess many things, or even all things, so that everything could be in one's own power and according to one's own will. This is the love of worldly possessions. The emptiness of the heart, which has deprived itself of real delight in the one who is everything, generates a thirst for many and various false pleasures. The searching and striving for those innumerable things in which one hopes to find sensory pleasure both inwardly and outwardly. So a sinner persists incessantly in his troubles and anxieties, and in his search for excessive knowledge, many possessions, and diverse pleasures. He is always delighting in outward things, constantly acquiring possessions, scrutinizing things and testing them. He whirls around in this circular process for his entire life, this inquisitiveness attracts and entices the mind. The heart hopes to taste sweet things, and the will is carried away. 
Anyone can verify this by putting the movements of his soul under his own observation for just a single day. And a sinner would remain in this ceaseless world forever if he were left alone, for such is the nature of our slavery to sin. But this whirling is intensified and complicated a thousand times because the sinner is not alone. There is a whole world full of other people whose main concern is to test and scrutinize, to please themselves and to possess. These people have justified all these things to themselves. They have put them in a certain order, subjected them to certain rules of propriety, and imposed the necessity of acting in accordance with these rules upon everyone under their dominion. Being connected with each other, these people necessarily come into contact and into conflict. During these frictions, people increase their inquisitiveness, their love for possessions, and their self-indulgence tenfold, a hundredfold, and a thousandfold. People tie all their happiness, bliss, and life to these things. This world of vanity, whose occupations, customs, rules, connections, and relationships, language, pleasures, entertainments, and concepts, in short, everything, from things that are small and insignificant to things of great importance, all these things are impregnated with and steeped in the spirit of these children of troubles about many things that were mentioned above. They are the cause of the dreary ruin of the spirit in these lovers of this world. Being actively united with this entire world, every sinner falls into its broad nets, wraps himself in them, and is so deeply buried that he cannot be seen. A heavy burden lies upon the sinner, that lover of this world, and on each of his members. He has no power to move or stir, not even a little. He cannot do anything that is not in accordance with the spirit of this world. To do otherwise, he must throw off this impossible load. That is why nobody undertakes this backbreaking work. Nobody even thinks about it. Everybody lives on in the same way, moving along the tracks in which he finds himself. In addition to this, our trouble is redoubled since there is in this world its own prince, who is the first among all other creatures by reason of his guile and lies, his wickedness and his experience in seduction. By means of the flesh and materiality, with which the soul has mingled and merged through the fall, this prince has free access to the soul. He comes to the soul and kindles the fires of inquisitiveness, the love for worldly possessions, and sensual self-indulgence. By different kinds of flattery, he keeps people immersed in these states, hopelessly, constantly, and without any way out. By means of all sorts of promptings, he instigates different ideas so that a man may try to satisfy them. Satan then either helps to fulfill these ideas, or else he destroys the man's first plans and suggests new ones which are even more seductive. He does all this with one sole aim, to prolong and deepen a man's staying in these states. All this constitutes a chain of worldly fortunes and misfortunes that is not blessed by God. This prince has an entire horde of subordinates, the spirits of wickedness. Every moment they rush about through the entire inhabited world in order to sow in one place one kind of seed and in another place another sort. They do this in order to ensnare more deeply those who have already wrapped themselves in the nets of sin and to repair those fetters which had weakened, become loose or broken. They do this so that no one will take it into his head to become free from their chains and escape into freedom. In this latter case, they hastily gather around a willful person. At first, they come one by one, then by detachments, and then by legions, and finally with their entire horde. They do this under various guises and in different ways in order to block all the exits. 
in other comparison. They do this in order to push back into the abyss the one who has just begun to crawl up out of it. In this invisible kingdom, there are certain throne rooms where plans are drawn up, orders given, and reports rendered and received, either with approval or with reproach for the demon who fulfilled his duties. According to the expression of St. John the Theologian, these throne rooms are the depths of Satan. On the earth, in the midst of Satan's kingdom of people, these throne rooms are as follows. Groups of scoundrels, debauchers, and especially groups of blasphemous unbelievers who pour out sinful darkness everywhere by means of their actions, speech, and writing, and through this obstruct God's light. The instrument by which the demons express their will and power in this world is the whole complex aggregate of worldly customs, which are impregnated with and steeped in sinful elements. These worldly customs stupefy a man and seduce him from God. This is the configuration of the sinful sphere. Every sinner is entirely immersed in this sphere, but he is kept in it by one particular thing. And this one thing can sometimes be tolerable in appearance, or even laudable. Satan has one concern, that when a man is completely occupied in his consciousness, his will, and his heart, he is not solely and exclusively devoted to God, but to something that is apart from him. So, having been joined to these things that are apart from God with his mind, will, and heart, he may have them instead of God, and may care only for them, may scrutinize only them, may take delight only in them, and may possess only them. This concerns not only the bodily passions and the passions of the soul, but also the things which are proper and becoming. For example, learning, arts and crafts, and the cares of the day. Everything of this kind can serve as a fetter by means of which Satan keeps blinded and dazzled sinners under his dominion and does not allow them to come to their senses or to collect themselves. If one looks at a sinner's inward disposition and outward state, then it will be found that sometimes he knows much, but is blind with regards to the works of God and the matters of his salvation. It will be evident that though he is incessantly troubled, he is not active with respect to the establishment of his salvation. Even though he experiences alarm or delight in his heart, he is completely insensitive and dead to everything that is spiritual. In this regard, all the faculties of our being are injured by sin, and a sinner is characterized by blindness, negligence, and deadness. He does not see his state and that is why he is not aware of the dangers of his state. He is not aware of his danger, and that is why he does not care to rid himself of it. He, it does not even occur to him that he must change and work out his salvation. He is in the firm belief, which nothing can shake, that he is in good state and on the right way, so he does not wish for anything else, and he works so that everything should remain as it is. That is why he considers any reminder about another way of life as unnecessary for himself. He does not listen to these reminders and cannot even understand what they are for. He avoids and flees from them. Chapter 3 The Action of God's Grace We have already mentioned that a sinner is in the same position as a man who is submerged in deep sleep. Just as one who is in deep sleep cannot awaken by himself and cannot get up if some danger approaches, he needs someone else to come and awaken him. So also one who is submerged in the sleep of sin cannot come to his senses and collect himself. He cannot rise up if God's grace will not come to his assistance. According to God's infinite mercy, his grace is available for everyone. It comes around to everyone and appeals in a distinct way to each person. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. 
This comparison of sinners to those who are asleep gives us certain points for a comprehensive examination of their conversation to God. For example, with one who is asleep, first he wakes up, then he gets up out of bed, and finally he makes up his mind to go do something. So also with a sinner who turns towards God and repents, first he wakes up from the sleep of sin, then he he comes to some determination to change. He is getting up. And finally, he clothes himself in strength for a new life with the sacraments of confession and Eucharist. He is ready to act. In the parable of the prodigal son, these moments are indicated in the following way. First, he came to himself. This means that he came to his senses and collected himself. Then he said, I will arise and go meaning that he intends to stop his former way of life. Then he arose and went to his father and said, I have sinned. This is his repentance. And then the father clothed him in his best robe, which indicates his absolution, and set the table for him, the Holy Eucharist. So, in the conversion of sinners to God, there are three movements. Awakening from the sleep of sin, rising up, with the determination to leave one's sin and dedicate oneself to pleasing God, and the clothing of the sinner with strength from above for this matter of pleasing God in the sacraments of confession and Eucharist.